Okay, before that, let me. Shoykata, you're muted. You're muted. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the topic of my talk today is uh, fluid mechanics as a tool in medical science and as I said yesterday, medical science is a huge term. Uh, we are going to see soon uh, which specific area of medical science I uh, refer to over here. Uh, but before that, uh, this is uh, our second Vanguard lecture after my colleague Shorab Nath presented yesterday. Uh, we should also thank uh, the current folks at JU for helping us to arrange this. Okay, so before I go into the work uh, that I want to present on today, this is a group of French scientists uh, from the 1930s. And uh, the work they did back then in Paris is probably the best way to describe what we are trying to do now. I'll come to the story at the very end, but let's just keep them in mind. So today, uh, let me take a few minutes first to uh, give some account of my academic and research background and how the work that uh, I'm doing with my students here at South Dakota State connects to where I started from at JU. So at Jadokpur, I uh, did my bachelor's in uh, civil engineering. And in civil, we had a course called uh, hydraulics. And hydraulics was taught in two uh, courses in series, hydraulics one and hydraulics two. Uh, the content was very simple. Uh, it was basic fluid mechanics. But after doing that course or those two courses, I knew that if I go to graduate school, if I uh, do a PhD, that would be related to fluid mechanics. So I graduated in 2009 and then I, in 2008, I started applying for uh, graduate school in the US. I eventually had uh, four funded offers, uh, but the only place where the potential supervisor was a fluid mechanician was at Virginia Tech. Uh, so it was a simple choice. I did not think about the, the prestige of the university, rather I wanted to work in an area which at that point of time, I was just 22 years, 23 years old. Uh, at that point of time, I wanted to work in fluid mechanics and mathematics and I made my choice. Maybe that was not the best choice at that point, but I took my call. So I came to Virginia Tech. I started working in theoretical fluid mechanics. And to be more specific, I developed some very complex mathematical models for vortex works that are slightly more complicated than the simple Kalman vortex treat. And uh, I finished in 2014, but as I was closing in on my PhD, I gradually realized that to become a faculty, uh, I need to do something beyond theoretical fluid mechanics. Because as the situation was back then, and it's the same even now, there is just not enough research funding in theoretical projects. So uh, I was applying for postdoc positions. The first uh, offer came from uh, OIST in Japan. It was uh, in an experimental fluid mechanics group. And I thought that, okay, fine. I see people doing experiments around me, they're flourishing, so let's do some experiments. So I went to Japan. That was uh, summer of 2014. And the summer was not even over. I knew that I'm too lazy for experiments. I don't enjoy waking up in the morning to go to the lab. I don't enjoy building an experimental setup. And I don't enjoy doing experiments. So. I realized that this is not what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I was in Japan for a year and a half. And let me qualify it over here that the experience in Japan still helps me. It helps me to figure out what might be the possible difficulties in an experiment. Because as, as a theoretical person, as a computational person, I have to collaborate with experimentalists all the time. 
in almost all the projects that I'm going to discuss today. So we do need experiments, but not every one of us are uh, suited for everything in science. So we need to figure out where our true call is. And for me, it was initially theory. And as I'm going to approach further in this presentation, I moved gradually towards computations, but I knew that experiments is not my cup of tea. Uh, but that experience that I gathered in Japan, it still helps. So in 2015, I started applying for more positions and the first offer came from UNC Chapel Hill. It was a postdoc position. Uh, it was at their medical school. So I moved to UNC in 2016. Uh, there I moved to computational fluid mechanics in terms of my research. I started working with a team of physicians uh, on a wide range of interdisciplinary projects. And um, typically those projects were related to computational modeling of uh, respiratory airflow and on tracking drug delivery trends and how droplets transmit through anatomic pathways. So I was at UNC for uh, two and a half years. That was an exciting experience. I, uh, as I said, I was working with the doctors and while doing so, I gradually realized that uh, physio physiology and, and medical science as a field, it still has a number of open questions. And uh, if you talk to the doctors, if you work with them, they would share with you where the limits of knowledge are right now and uh, what might be the important open questions in any field. However, uh, the doctors, if you think about them in any country or in any society, uh, they do not have that undivided time or the resources to address those open questions uh, with all the tools from theory, from computations, from experiments that we now have at our disposal. So therein, I think, lies the great need of interdisciplinary collaborations. And uh, that's where I'm going to go next in this, in this talk. So with collaborations, let's think of what our role might be, our role as, as engineers. Uh, on that vein, let's look at this quote from Schrodinger. Uh, this is from a very famous book called uh, What is Life? It's a very thin book. You should read it up. Uh, he was writing this book in the 1940s. There he says, we are only now beginning to acquire reliable material for welding together the sum total of all that is known into a whole. Uh, so this is, as I said, in the 1940s. Okay, hang on for a moment. I don't think the recording started. Is anyone else recording the, uh, the, the talk? Yes, yes, I'm recording. You can carry on. Okay, good. Uh, so, yeah, so this was 1940s. Schrodinger made this comment. All good, but where do we stand in 2021? I think still biology and medical science, they are the relatively more nascent areas of human knowledge. But as I said at the very beginning that biology, medical science, physiology, whatever you might call it, these are huge terms. And uh, it is not possible for a single individual to work in that entire field. We need to figure out what is uh, our areas of interest, what can be a smaller subtopic, and then you start spotting the important problems that might be there and you try to solve them. In my case, I thought about, okay, I know a lot of fluid mechanics. I have done theory. I have done some experiments. I did do some experiments in Japan and I know a fair bit of computations. Uh, so can fluid mechanics uh, be used as a tool that can be a game changer? And from my second postdoctoral experience in, 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 uh, at UNC, I knew about uh, ENT. So that position was with the Department of Otolaryngology, which in simpler words is the ear, nose, throat department or ENT. So I knew about nasal anatomy. I knew about uh, 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 what happens in our throat, those kind of things. So, okay, let's think about using fluid mechanics over there. 
But as I said, once you figure out, okay, this is the soft field that is probably going to be a good fit for my skills. Let's figure out the open problems in there. So for the last five, six years, I have been working on and for the last two years with my students on a number of projects. They range from uh, designing new kinds of nasal drugs, uh, looking at different kinds of upper airway or lower airway surgeries. We can use computational fluid mechanics to check the reliability of uh, new kinds of imaging, uh, medical imaging uh, platforms. And for the last 10 months, I'll be frank with you guys, I think I have been working almost every day, including the weekends on COVID-19 uh, since middle of March. So there, there has been some plenty of new data on COVID-19 as well. But thankfully, since I was already working on nasal uh, transport, the, the, the topic of COVID-19 is somewhat within my set of skills. For the talk today, I'm going to present uh, some results on these three uh, yellow marked squares, uh, nasal drugs, nasal surgeries, and COVID-19. And this, this line of research belongs to track one of my research program in my group. So I try to think of my research program to be divided into two groups, track one and track two. Track one is more on using the tools that I have, essentially computations theory, and working with others, some experiments, using those tools uh, to answer some specific translational clinical questions. So that is track one. And track two is thinking about the basic fluid mechanics and how that can relate to uh, different biomedical systems. Okay, so let's think about track one, translational applications. Let's look at three applications. Okay, so this is uh, the 3D reconstruction of uh, a nasal airway. It was built from uh, uh, CT scans of an individual. And uh, I wanted to show this because building this kind of anatomically realistic geometries is the stepping stone uh, for most of the projects that I'm going to discuss today because we want to develop our fluid mechanics models in realistic geometries, which should help them to be useful to the actual clinicians. Okay, so before I go into the details of any project, let's, let's give you a rundown of the basic steps that are involved. Uh, as I said, uh, everything starts with uh, making sure that the geometries that we are working on are realistic. And hence, we uh, work with the clinicians to get uh, medical scans. Most of the times, it is a CT scan uh, for the corresponding geometry that we are trying to develop. So this top uh, graphic, it shows a coronal cross-section. Uh, so typically, when uh, uh, someone gets CT scans in the head area, what happens is uh, the imaging platform grabs uh, images at different penetration depths through the head at depth increments of 0.4 millimeters. We get those sets of images. Typically for an adult uh, human subject, we have to collect between 250 to 300 such scans. We can digitally stack them up one on top of another to develop 3D reconstructions that look like these visuals at the bottom. And uh, the the, 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 the topic that I'm going to discuss today is related to a certain nasal ailment. It is called chronic rhinosinusitis. It uh, is pretty common. It, uh, I have the, the figures in the US. Uh, apparently almost 11 million Americans uh, gets this disease every year. It is linked to facial pain, loss of smell, nasal obstruction. And in terms of treatment, uh, we have topical sprays. That's the first line of treatment. Uh, another first line of treatment is uh, uh, corticosteroids, but if they don't work, the doctors can go ahead and do some corrective surgeries on the nasal anatomy to help the flow of air inside the nose. Uh, these CT scans uh, at the bottom sh show you what happens to the to the to the nasal passage when someone has this this condition. On the left, you have a normal scan, so this uh, uh, black 
voids, those are the sinus cavities, but you can see on the right that uh, that person uh, with that disease got some mucus buildup in those sinus cavities. Okay, uh, so that's the clinical condition that we are going to address in this project. Uh, again, before going into the details of the data, uh, let me give you another brief description of what are the different steps. So I have already discussed, we have to grab CT scans, we have to build the digital models. Those models are uh, then meshed on a software and uh, the mesh model is used to run the computational fluid dynamics uh, simulations. And in terms of simulations, we first simulate uh, the, the breathing in that person. And uh, then we can track uh, droplet delivery or drug delivery in that, in that model. Now, the question is whether we are tracking droplets or particles, those kind of questions or what kind of breathing rates we are trying to simulate. Those are a function of the question that you are trying to address. You are not going to keep on running the same kind of simulation for someone who is running compared to someone who is sleeping and snoring. So the modeling framework does uh, get changed a bit based on the question that we have in mind. So it is important to know your physics, know your fluid mechanics, but know the real world as well, what you are trying to do. Anyways, eventually after the simulations, you can post process the simulated data uh, to figure out the answers to the questions that you started out from. And uh, I have this slide here. It's, it's uh, not very interesting, but I wanted to point out that these are very complex geometries compared to uh, the idealist, I, I, sorry, the idealized geometries that uh, we engineers are used to working on. So a critical step in there is uh, actually coming up with good quality meshed models. Uh, usually when we are modeling uh, geometries that is just the upper nasal airway, we have around four to six, four million cells. But if we include the, the lower airway or part of the throat, then the number of elements in that meshed model uh, can be as high as 6 million. And this takes a while, just going through this. It's slightly tedious, but uh, boredom is a part of life. Okay, now once the meshed models are ready, uh, we can simulate breathing in those geometries. And as I said, uh, the kind of simulation, the kind of numerical scheme that you would want to use depends on the question that you have at hand. For example, if a person is breathing steadily, gently, that flow physics can be modeled by a viscous laminar scheme. But if the person is, uh, let's imagine snoring, as I pointed out earlier, uh, that's a really very transient and very uneven flow. And typically we try to use some kind of turbulence scheme to make sure that we grab that nuance into our simulation. Uh, typically, I run the simulations with a certain uh, pressure drop that is going to drive the flow from the nostril openings to the throat. And uh, we try out a number of pressure drops to uh, figure out the breathing rate that we want to simulate. And that breathing rate depends on, sometimes depends on the breathing measurements in that subject. In some projects, we are not in a position to know the breathing measurement. But in some projects, if we have recruited those subjects, uh, we do collect some data on how uh, on how fast their typical breathing rates might be. So you use uh, the pressure drop to come up with whatever breathing rate you want to simulate. And once the simulations are done, oh, by the way, let me point out uh, a couple of more things. So when you, if after the simulation, you do want to know where the particles are uh, going through the nose or where the droplets are going through the nose, you need to run some particle tracking simulations. I do that using a discrete phase model. Uh, I, I, I track the particles against the ambient airflow and the particles are uh, getting influenced by uh, the viscous drag and other body forces. And the eventual output uh, from these simulations are the particle or droplet deposition numbers at different points of that anatomic model. And we can then post-process that, that data to figure out the question that we are trying to, trying to solve. Okay, so in this particular uh, sub project, as I started out that I'm going to discuss about nasal drugs. And in terms of nasal drugs, we are looking at nasal sprays because as I said, nasal sprays 
are one of the first modes of treatment for chronic rhinosinusitis, which is the clinical condition that we are trying to address here. So if it is a nasal spray that we are trying to simulate, we better get some realistic data on sprays before we can simulate anything. So for this, this branch of work, I typically collaborate with a number of drug discovery companies. So for this particular project, uh, I worked with a company called Nexpret. So I sent them a number of over-the-counter nasal sprays that we find over here. And they tested them for the plume geometry, for the exit speed of the, uh, the particles coming out of the spray nozzle, uh, what might be the size distribution of the particles in that plume, those kind of details. And once we have that set of data from them, uh, we can input them into the computational model uh, and get a realistic idea about where those uh, spread particles might be landing in the anatomic geometry. Okay, so now we have some CT scan based realistic geometries. We have spray data. Uh, we know uh, the kind of numerical scheme that we are going to use. Let's directly dive into the results now. And uh, the question that we are going to address here is, is there a way to improve targeted drug delivery with uh, nasal sprays? Because that's a, a question that we have. We are using topical nasal sprays. We want to improve their performance. How to do that? To answer that question, we first started to make some observations. The first observation was this. So just look at these two, two, two visuals. And uh, if you look at the smaller particle, five micron, you see that, uh, well, you don't really see that here, but the red spot is where, the red circle is where the initial motion of the particle has stopped. And uh, Whatever it does beyond that is because of the streamline on which it was embedded. It has a, it has a low Stokes number, so uh, it just follows the streamlines. On the other hand, for a slightly bigger particle, which in this case on the right is a 225 micron particle, there the initial motion can persist longer. It, it continues till uh, where the red part of the trajectory is, and eventually it does get uh, influenced by the streamline, which is over there, and it deposits uh, at that part of the nose. Where, so that, 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 that upper part of the nasal airway is where some of the, the sinus uh, cavities are. It's the ethmoid sinus over there. I forgot to mention at the beginning of the talk today, we have four different kinds of sinuses. The two big sacs on the two sides underneath the cheeks, they're called the maxillary sinus. They're the biggest sinuses. The one under our forehead, which is which looks like the horn over here, is the frontal sinus. Uh, the smaller nodules where this particle, for example, has landed, they are the ethmoid sinuses. And that bulb-like uh, cavity that is jutting out at the very back, uh, that's the sphenoid sinus. So we have four different, uh, different kinds of sinuses. Uh, but anyways, looking back at these visuals, we see that, okay, uh, based on the particle sizes, the inertia of the particles are going to be different. And that would have a lot uh, of role in uh, figuring out where uh, it would land. So if we can direct the particles towards our target site, so every clinical condition, we know that uh, the disease starts from certain specific areas. So if we can send the drugs directly over there, we might get better clinical response, right? It may, it's, it's common sense. Okay, before I go further into this talk, can anyone confirm that uh, uh, you can, uh, this talk is getting recorded because it's not at my end? Yes, definitely, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so from here, we realize that there is an effect of inertia. Let's see what is going on here. Now, in a real situation, we are not going to look at one single particle, right? Uh, you are not going to throw one single, single uh, sphere into your nose. You are going to use a real uh, spread combination of drugs. And drugs or, or, or sprays, they have a range of particle sizes. Uh, so let's look at what is going on here. Here we are looking at uh, flowness. I frankly don't know if there is flowness in India or not, but it's one of the over the counter, very common nasal sprays here in the US. And uh, I worked with that other drug discovery company to figure out what might be the size range of particles 
in, in, in flowness, it was found to be five to 525 microns. Now, once we simulated uh, that spray into a nasal geometry, we see that there are some very interesting things. If we use that entire size range, five to 525, we see this, this, this distribution that's on the left. Fine, but once we curtail that size range, once we make sure that we are just simulating particles that are smaller than 100 microns, or, or sorry, in this case, they are bigger than 100 microns. That means we are just simulating the bigger particles. We see that they get trapped in the anterior parts of the nose. It makes sense, right? The bigger particles, they have stronger inertia. They go fast and directly hit the wall uh, uh, based on the inertia and they get lodged over there. So based on this phenomenon, we realize that if we can target the spray axis towards the clinical target for that particular disease, then maybe we would be able to send most of the drugs to that target site. And this understanding is very fundamental. It doesn't really matter if it is a chronic sinusitis. It doesn't matter if it is SARS-CoV-2. The idea is the same. You want to send the drugs where they're supposed to be meant for. And especially when you are in the initial phase of infection, when you know that that is the infection site, which is, which is uh, playing the evil game. You want your, your, your uh, soldiers to be over there. Okay, now to send the soldiers over there or the drug particulates over there, we need to know, or, or, or rather, uh, let me put it this way, to figure out a better way to send the soldiers, we need to know what is going on right now. We need to know how the soldiers are being sent right now. Uh, so we looked at the package instructions for nasal sprays and typically, and this is true even in India, if you look at, if you ever buy a nasal spray and you, if you look at the instructions, uh, typically they would say that incline your head slightly forward, hold the spray bottle vertically upright and enter it slightly inside your nose. Uh, this sketch was actually done by me a few months back. Uh, we tried to interpret uh, that set of instructions in this way on the right. Uh, we inclined the digital head forward by 22.5 degrees. We had the spray bottle upright and we inserted it by a small distance of five millimeters into the nose. And we call this particular way to use the nasal spray as uh, current use. And we simulated the drug delivery trends for current use. And then the idea was, can we come up with something else, a different set of instructions that would improve the drug delivery over this current use? Okay, now to figure out whether we can actually better what current use is doing, we need to know what is the target site. I have not discussed that yet. So these blue areas are the target sites. They're called, those regions are called the osteometal complex or OMC. By the way, I know most of you are engineers here. I am an engineer. So it was a pain back in 2015, 16 for me to learn all these complex terms. Uh, I had a hard time remembering osteometal complex. Anyways, but, but you will pick up new skills as you go along over the next 10 years, don't worry. Anyways, so OMC is the target site. And uh, as an engineer, it's not me who figured that out uh, to talk to the doctors. And they, they, they suggested that, okay, you are trying to uh, address a question in, in a sinus disease, right? So ideally sinuses should be your target sites, but we have four different kinds of sinuses. And also the sinuses are sort of like appendages to the main nasal passage. So you cannot really send drugs towards the sinuses. So what, what, what can be the common weak point? So this OMC is where all the sinus cavities are draining their liquids in. And the OMC or the airspace around OMC is also the common airflow exchange corridor. So if you can send the drugs over there, fluid transport along the nasal walls will make sure that some of the drugs would go into the sinuses as well and help in reducing the inflammation. So that is how we are trying to address all the sinus cavities by finding their common weak link, which is what we see here. So that is the target site, fine. So now we have to simulate the drugs uh, so that they can reach that target site. And to do that, we need to first figure out well, here we are trying to improve our way of sending drugs over there, right? So can we actually see this OMC uh, in, a in a model? 
so first we look at this nasal geometry. And if you focus in there, that red chunk over there is actually the OMC. So it is indeed possible if you can move someone's uh, head around and try to uh, track the nasal anatomy, you can indeed see part of the, uh, the OMC in that person's nose. Of course, we are not trained to do that. Uh, the doctors can figure out because you don't have the color coding uh, looking at a real nose, but the doctors can see the OMC. Okay, so we can see the OMC. So the idea is now this. If you look at that uh, visual on the top right, uh, let's place the spray bottle in that direction. And let's use the fact that inertia drives a lot of particle transport. So if you can put the spray axis in that direction, many of the larger particles would be automatically driven towards OMC. And let's see if that helps the drug delivery. So basically we try to do something based on the physics that we understand. And then we see if that works. If it doesn't work, fine. We need to revisit our conjecture. We need to revisit our hypothesis and figure some other way out. But this is what this is the, the, the road that I wanted to track for this particular project. Let's put the spray bottle in that, in that direction and let's see what happens. Uh, in the previous slide, I just looked at a uh, in silico geometry, right? And, and we know that uh, computational geometries and what goes on in real life can be quite different. Uh, now, before taking another person's nose, this is the next thing that I could do. I had some 3D printed models of real nose and uh, I knew where the OMC was. I inserted this blue wire through another hole on the side, which the details I'm not going to go into, but I can figure out where the OMC is and I placed that blue wire over there and I use this nasal speculum. So this is a typical thing that doctors use. Uh, if you go uh, to an ENT surgeon, they can check some part of your nose using a simple speculum like this. So indeed we can figure out where the OMC is even through a clinic visit. So if this is the new way to uh, place the spray bottle in the nose, the doctors can actually instruct the patient on how to do that. So that was all good. So the next step is actually developing some simulated data. And we first worked on this specific trial model before going all the way in and trying, our, trying out our hypothesis in other subjects. We saw that uh, the drug delivery increased by almost eight folds or to be more exact 7.7 .7 folds. Uh, so more part of the drugs that were being administered through the nostril, a better fraction of it did manage to reach the OMC, which is that red chunk on this digital model. So this is great, eight fold increase, that's awesome. So let's let's look at other subjects. So we ran this study in uh, five subjects. Uh, the drug delivery was not uh, uniformly increasing in all of them. And because it is all a function of the nasal geometry and we know that all of us are different, we have differences in our nasal geometries. So the differences are there. The range of improvement was seem to be two to 16 folds. And the average increase was eight folds. But even a two fold increase is, is improvement, right? For that person. So this was an important study. And uh, until now, everything was in the computational world. And just like uh, I have reservations about experiments sometimes, which I should not, experiments are the best things in the world, I guess. People do have reservations about computations as well. So whenever you, if you are a computational guy, if you are a theoretical, theoretical guy, you need to work with the experimentalists and, and, and uh, validate your data with real physical data. And I did not understand that back in the 2010s, 2012s, but now I think that experiments are a very key component of anything that you might do as an engineer. So even if you don't, if you, even if you are not good at running experiments, just the way I am, make sure that you understand what are the different difficulties that might be there because otherwise you won't be successful in science. Okay, so we had a very strong computational finding. Now we have to validate this, how to do that. So I figured out that uh, it is very difficult for an experimentalist to just track whatever drugs have deposited in that OMC area. It, 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 it's very difficult because the OMC, first of all, is not that easy to see when you are thinking about a real 3D printed nasal model. It, it has a lot of geometric uh, topological complexity. So it is difficult to, to, to compare 
the OMC deposits in the CFD and the OMC deposits in the 3D printed uh, model in experiments. So we had to be a little innovative. What I proposed we should do is uh, this. We broke up the 3D printed uh, replicas of the digital models into a number of compartments and they were aligned along the X, Y, Y, Z and Z, X plans. And in this setup, what we show is uh, we use some nasal sprays into, into those 3D printed replicates. And those nasal sprays were spiked with mildly radioactive technetium. So once the sprays were uh, administered after the drugs have settled inside the nasal geometry, uh, you could see the radioactive signals coming out from different parts, different component, compartments of this, of this uh, 3D printed model. And then we can compare the signals uh, and use them to quantify the drug deposit from the experiments and compare that to the experiment. So I guess it makes sense to you. So basically we are comparing the compartments in those three alignments and comparing the data, both from the experiments as well as from the CFD. Uh, and this way we don't really have to worry too much about the topological complexity within each compartment uh, because you are comparing your data throughout the geometry and in three directions. So with this, with this setup, let's look at how the comparison fared. Uh, we, as I said, we, I did not say that, but I, we had three sets of compartments. We call them sagittal columns, frontal columns, sagittal rows. So anything from the side, we call it sagittal and anything from the front is frontal. So we have sagittal columns, sagittal rows and frontal columns. And uh, we see that uh, over here, uh, the blue lines, I don't think I have the color coding here, which is unfortunate, but the blue lines, uh, no, I have it at the very bottom. So the blue line is uh, the CFD, the yellow line is coming from the experiment. And uh, on the vertical axis, I have the drug delivery fraction at the OMC, the target site. And on the horizontal axis, I have the different compartments. And you see that although they're not exactly equal, they, the trends are the same, which is great. I mean, computations occur in a very idealized world at least we do have realistic geometries, but still it is idealized. Uh, on the other hand, experiments do manage to uh, uh, include many of the real physical nuances if they're run well. So although the differences are there, but the trends are same. And then I ran a correlation test and the, the, the correlation coefficient was high enough. So this shows that the computational framework that we have developed can be trusted. The numbers that we have come up with can be trusted. So there is a way to improve drug delivery with just nasal sprays, just by altering the way you hold the spray device. And this can be used, and this data in general can be used, uh, first of all, by the drug manufacturers. They can, they can come up with better designs for the spray device. They can come up with better designs for the drug particulates by figuring out which are the particle sizes that go to the nasopharynx, uh, to the OMC, which is the target site here. And I think what can happen right now is if uh, uh, the clinicians can recommend to the patient what might be the best way to hold the spray device based on that person's nasal anatomy. So this is the next avenue, personalized healthcare. You can use computations, you can use fluid mechanics, you can use experimental fluid mechanics to improve healthcare and make it more personalized for each individual. Uh, that uh, visual on the top, uh, on the right, bottom right is uh, uh, a real ONC uh, that a doctor would see uh, when using a nasal speculum. Okay, so this concludes the first sub-project that, that I wanted to discuss. So the next one that I want to discuss on, and we are not going to go into that much of details. I wanted to go into more details with the previous one because I wanted to give you a flavor of, or, 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 or a flavor of the philosophy that I believe in uh, when I do my science. Uh, I think I've made myself pretty clear, but uh, let's go into the next sub-project, uh, nasal surgeries. So what do we mean by nasal or any kind of surgery? How can we help, help surgeries? The thing is, every person, as I said, is different. So a surgery that works for someone might not work for the next person. And as of now, the way doctors decide is not always systematic. They do trust their experience and uh, most of the times they do get it right. 
but can we as engineers develop a framework that can help the doctors to make their decisions? So that was the inspiration from where it started. And I was working with a team of physicians on this. So for this particular project, we, are, we were looking at different kinds of nasal surgeries. So people in this, in this particular question, uh, uh, the doctors, they were thinking about a certain condition called nasal valve collapse, which sort of constrains the opening into the nose. And there are three different kinds of nasal surgeries right now. Uh, the butterfly graft, uh, it is the oldest one. Oh, sorry, uh, the second one is the oldest. Butterfly graft, I think it developed over the last 20 years or so. So the butterfly graft, it keeps the nasal opening taut in the horizontal direction. The spreader graft, which is the older one, it is it, it keeps the opening taut in the longitudinal direction. And the newest one is the lateral graft. It is a bioabsorbable implant that is placed along the nasal bones. So we considered these three different surgeries and we tried to figure out what might be the best one. So we had a set of subjects. The subjects in this case were uh, human cadavers. We had cadaveric heads, we scanned uh, those cadaveric heads and developed their, their CT-based models. And we ran some airflow simulations and then we compared what happens pre-surgery and post-surgery. So in those cadavers, the doctors, they, 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 they basically did these surgeries and we scanned before and after the surgery. And then after simulating, we compared the airflow before and after the surgery. And we see that the airflow resistance uh, improves by almost 34% in the butterfly graft compared to the other two. So at least for those subjects, the butterfly graft was the better one. I'm not claiming that spreader or lateral is not going to be the better choice for someone else. It can be. So that's why we need bigger studies on that. But what I'm trying to get at is this. The next avenue that we engineers can work on is personalized healthcare. So imagine a patient who has gone to the clinic. The doctor has recommended some medical scans, some CT scans. As computational engineers, we can develop a framework that will generate a CT-based model that will give full visual of the airflow patterns, the drug delivery trends, by the time of the next clinic visit. We can also develop models with different virtual surgeries, as I said. And we can make that information available to the clinicians and the doctors can then use that, that data as a tool while they make the decision on what can be the best topical drug for that person or what can be the best surgery for that person. So this is an exciting direction where I think my program is going to eventually evolve into. So that concludes the, the second sub project, which is how we can help uh, surgeons uh, making their decisions. The next topic is COVID-19. And uh, as I said, the last 10 months, they have been a blur for me. Uh, I think I've been waking up around 4 a.m. every day and coming to work. It, it has been crazy. Uh, and I think uh, it started from middle of March. I still remember it was middle or end of March. Many faculty members in the US we received uh, a letter from National Science Foundation or NSF. They are the main funding body. People who don't know, they are the main funding body uh, for basic science in the US. So NSF wanted us to come up with uh, innovative ideas to mitigate the COVID-19 challenge. And, and, and pay attention that this is still March. So we did not know anything at that point of time. And I think that kickstarted the process. So I have been leading a number of projects on COVID-19 and all of them our collaborations because uh, you can tell COVID-19, it is a very strong interdisciplinary challenge at the core of it. So the teams that I am leading, they have people from infectious disease background. There are pharmacologists, there are clinicians with background in rhinology. We have biomedical engineers and, and there is me who is a fluid mechanician. So it's, it's an interdisciplinary uh, pursuit. Anyways, so with COVID-19, I have started working on a number of projects. And uh, I think, frankly, fluid mechanics, thanks to COVID-19, has never been in this much of public eye before. At least not since the era of Cold War, when that generation was developing rockets and whatnot. Uh, by the way, compared to what they did, what we are going to do now is going to be more useful than developing rockets. 
Anyway, so fluid mechanics has never been in this much of public attention. And uh, there is a lot that you can do. So my team has come up with the, 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 the different things that, we, that I would show you today are more conceptual than going into the pharmacological details because we are working on a number of antiviral therapeutics for COVID-19, which can complement what the vaccines are going to do. Uh, the antivirals are supposed to help treat someone who is actually sick while vaccines are supposed to be a preventive measure, right? So I'm not going to go into those kind of details. I'm going to show some conceptual findings that we have seen using computational fluid mechanics. Okay, so the two questions that I'm going to, or I'll try to discuss today are this, what are the hazardous droplet sizes? Implying we are inhaling air from around us, right? And as we have been told uh, by plenty of sources by now, uh, we inhale the bad droplets in and we get sick. But uh, there can be such a wide range of droplets in the air. So what are the sizes that we are talking about? And uh, we don't know that answer. At least we didn't know the answer before I started working on this particular project. So what are the hazardous droplet sizes? So that is the question that we are going to address today. And the second one is what is the infectious dose? So some of you might know about uh, what is the infectious dose. Infectious dose for any kind of uh, transmissible disease like COVID-19 is the minimum number of virions or virus particles that you would need to inhale to get infected. To give you a small example for influenza A virus, one has to inhale around 2000 to 3000 virus particles to get sick. So what is that corresponding number for COVID-19? And no one knows that yet. People are working on that and I am working on it as well, but we don't know for sure. But these are the two questions that we are going to discuss today. So let's think about the first question. What are the hazardous droplet sizes? That's a very specific question. We need to know a bit more before we can figure out what are the droplets that are the bad guys. We need to know what is the mechanism through which the infection starts. So a landmark paper on this came out in uh, July uh, on cell. And uh, actually it came out from UNC Chapel. So I knew that group and I knew about the data from around May onward. They, 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 they took cells from different parts of the upper airway and lower airway and they tried to infect those cells with SARS-CoV-2. And they found that the infectivity is very high for the cells from the upper airway. So the infection starts from the upper airway. Uh, it is because, uh, well, those cells, uh, those cells are the ciliated epithelial cells. They are rich in a type of membrane protein called SCE2. And uh, that is what the virus uses to intrude into the cells. So the infection is more or, or, or begins from the upper airway. Now, in the upper airway, uh, if you think about the anterior cavity, uh, it has a thick layer of mucus and that automatically provides some degree of protection and prevention against virus infection. Uh, so what is left? The, this red chunk, so if you look at the reconstructions on the bottom, that is the remaining part of the upper airway, nasopharynx, that has ciliated epithelial cells as well, which are the cells that are first getting infected. So we can conjecture, and this is supported by uh, some other studies as well. Uh, we can conjecture that nasopharynx is the first initial dominant infection site. So if we can treat the person during the initial phase of infection, we know that nasopharynx is the target site. If we can contain the, inf uh, the, the infection in the nasopharynx, the disease is not going to be very serious. The disease is not going to spread to the lower airway to the lungs and the person does not need to be ventilated. Uh, and the symptoms would be content with just having some, some, some nasal blocks and, and, and loss of smell and that's it. So it is important to figure out what is the target site? Where is the infection starting from? And in this case, we conjecture that it is, it is the nasopharynx. And this conjecture is supported by studies like, uh, as I was discussing before this uh, lecture started that nasopharyngeal swabs are initially more effective at figuring out positive detection than uh, oropharyngeal swabs. And uh, since then, that study, I think, came out in August. And since then, there have been more studies uh, on the fact that nasopharynx is the, is the first infection site. Okay, so we know the target site now. 
uh, a person has COVID-19 is in the initial phase of infection and uh, we want to treat that person. Uh, we want to treat that person with nasal drugs. Uh, and we know that the target site is nasopharynx. Uh, but the question that we had over here is what are the hazardous droplet sizes? So technically we are not really thinking about treating right now. I mentioned that because we are using the same concept to develop targeted therapeutics for COVID-19 as well. So we do need to know the droplets for that project as well. If we know that these are the droplets that can go to the nasopharynx, we can use that, that information to design new kinds of drugs. But here we are not going into those kinds of details because that has a number of pharmacological nuances as well. We are just looking at thinking about the mechanics. Uh, what are the droplets that are going to land at the nasopharynx? Okay, so I, this is an evolving project. I have run simulations in those two anatomic geometries from the previous slide. And I have run airflow or breathing simulations through them. I have tried breathing rates ranging from 15 liters per minute to 85 liters per minute. So this wide range covers all conditions from gentle steady breathing to forceful breathing. And then against those simulations, by the way, those simulations can be laminar. They are turbulent as well because 15 liters per minute is a laminar simulation, but as we go higher, we have to use turbulence schemes. I have used large any simulations to model that uh, rate of breathing. So once the airflow simulations are done, uh, we track the droplets. Uh, we figured out, we try a wide range of droplet sizes and we figured out what are the sizes that are ending up or that are land landing directly at the nasopharynx. And we see that it's a function of the flow rate. Fine, because the flow rate does have an effect on the particle trajectories, as we saw in the first project. But we see that there is this distinct zone where the, the particle crapping increases, uh, or, or rather the particle landing at uh, the nasopharynx increases. And that size range is around 2.5 to 19 microns, if I just look at these two subjects. So for these two subjects, we conclude that the hazardous size range over which more droplets are going to deposit at the nasopharynx is 2.5 to 19 microns. And I don't have other data from other subjects in this presentation, but that is the work that the students are doing right now. And we see that typically this is true. The size range that we need to be worried about is between two to 20 microns, because those are the ones that are landing directly at the nasopharynx, thereby launching the infection. By the way, for these simulations, I uh, uh, used a material density of 1.3 gram per milliliter for the droplets. There is a reason for that. Uh, these are the droplets. We are trying to figure out what are the droplets that are starting the infection, right? So basically, if uh, I am the person who is getting infected, I'm breathing in those droplets from the next person who already has COVID-19. So that person has expelled some droplets from their airways the droplets typically undergo environmental dehydration. And we know initially the droplets are made up of sputum. Sputum has a large uh, fraction of water. So the density initially is around one gram per milliliter, milliliter, fine. But then dehydration happens. So the water goes out. What remains are the non-volatile components, one of which are these variants and the density increases. So 1.3 gram per milliliter is actually an experimentally observed fact that this is the approximate density for a certain range of relative humidity because relative humidity again controls how much dehydration is going to happen is uh, what the next person who is getting infected, which in this case is me, uh, is going to breathe in, which is 1.3 gram per ml. Okay, so we have managed to figure out what is the hazardous size range. Uh, the next question that I have posed over here is what is the infectious dose or how many variants I would need to inhale to get sick. Uh, as I said, COVID-19 has uh, struck a huge uh, range of collaborations amongst the scientific community. There are a wide a variety of papers that are coming out. This is another striking study that came out on uh, the proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I think this was May. Uh, there they looked at uh, uh, the, the virus distribution in speech droplets. 
and uh, try to figure out what is the probability. Uh, did anyone say something? You guys can hear me, right? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so, so these guys, they try to figure out what is the probability of a droplet of a certain size to have a virus. And it was an experimental project. They figured out some very interesting um, things. Think about a 10 micron droplet, that's quite big. Uh, does anyone here know what is the size of a SARS-CoV-2 particle? Anyone? So it's around a point, like the biggest, it is a range. The biggest can be 0.2 microns. So technically, even a one micron or a 0.5 micron particle droplet can have a SARS-CoV-2 virus. But what they saw, the probability that a 10 micron droplet would have a virus is just around 0.37%. And the probability drops to 0.01% if the droplet size was initially three microns and then it dehydrated to a one micron droplet before the next person inhaled the droplet in. So these probabilities are pretty low for each droplet to carry a virion. I was not convinced with the data as you should not be. You should not be convinced by what I'm saying now. If you do science, you need to do the work on your own. Uh, so I wanted to uh, do these computations again and figure out uh, if the numbers are at all correct or not. And that's what we are going to do today as well. Checking these numbers. So to check these numbers, we need to know from where these virus particles are coming from. They're coming from inside of the nose and inside of the mouth. So those droplets are being generated from the sputum, which is a mixture of the mucus and the oral liquids. And this Ulfel et al. nature, it is another's Remarkable study that came out in April, I think. Uh, it came out from uh, a hospital in Munich. There, a group of physicians, they tested the viral load in their COVID positive patients over there. And they saw that there is a range of viral load. This is, this is the mean figure, seven times 10 to the power of six copies per milliliter of sputum. I'm using this number. So these are the number of virus particles that are there in the original liquid. Now from that liquid, the droplets are getting shed. Of course, I have to admit there is a certain level of approximation over here because that's what we engineers do as well. We cannot really replicate everything that is going on in the natural world. We, we make some assumptions. And that's what I'm going to do here. I assume that droplets are getting shed from that sputum. So if one milliliter had that many number of variants, what would a droplet of D microns would have? So this number on the right, uh, that, that, that uh, formula has that number uh, for D micron droplet. So if, and, and I call that number capital N. So if one droplet of D micron size has capital N number of variants. So in other words, one variant would be there in one over N capital N droplets. And I call that small n. So to find one variant or to come across one variant, we need to check that small n number of uh, D micron droplets. And then the chances are that you will find one variant. So we can think of this as uh, in probabilistic term terms. So the probability that there is at least one variant in a D micron droplet is one over n percent, right? Uh, so now just use this formulation that I have uh, uh, developed here. You can try the calculation even now. You just plug in uh, what is the value of D that you are testing. Here, I'm testing that data that came out on PNS. Uh, I tried uh, three microns, I tried 10 microns, and the numbers match. Voila. So the modeling framework that I am thinking of fits well with experimental data. So let's see what we can do next. And uh, what we are trying to do here is figuring out the infectious dose, how many virus particles we need to breathe in. And for that, we are going to use this uh, yellow stud calculation. Uh, but before I go over there, this is another uh, uh, nuance that I wanted to, to let you know, because we are still in, uh, we just developed that uh, relation on the probability of finding one virus particle in a droplet. It is a function of the relative humidity, right? you do realize that the relative humidity controls the, the, the vaporization, the dehydration of the droplets. So if there is higher dehydration, the droplets 
of the same size would have a higher viral load. So in drier areas, uh, a 10 micron droplet would have a higher viral load than in an area where the relative humidity is really high and hence the dehydration is low. So these are the numbers that I see from my computations that a 10 micron droplet would have 0.37% in a moderately humid environment of carrying one variant, but that 0.37%, it increases to almost 15% uh, uh, if it is in an environment where the relative humidity is quite uh, low and hence the viral load is high in the droplets. And this kind of trend can actually determine why we see such differing trends of infection in different parts of the planet. There are other factors as well. Temperature does play a role, I know, but relative humidity probably is playing the more dominant role over here. And uh, one reason why I say that is I ran simulations with uh, just one gram per ml density as well. The hazardous size range doesn't change. It is still around three to 20 microns instead of 2.5 to 19 microns. So the droplet sizes being all same, humidity is going to control how many virus particles are there in those droplets. And we know that if the humidity is low, there are more virus particles in the droplets. Okay, so let's again come back to the question, what is the infectious dose? This is a logic diagram. Uh, we don't need to go into the details. Uh, I developed this diagram uh, as a response to a review comment uh, for my paper on this study. And uh, you guys would soon know if you come to graduate school and do a PhD that uh, publishing a paper has a number of steps. Uh, writing the paper is just the first one. You need to address the review comments as well. Uh, anyways. So over here, the story that I'm trying to tell is this. Uh, we are trying to figure out the infectious dose. Uh, what I did is look at speech data from earlier studies uh, to figure out what are the range of droplet sizes that one emits while speaking. So I know the speech droplet data. And then I can use CFD uh, to figure out how many of those droplets are going to end up at the nasopharynx. You know the methods by now. We use CFD to figure out these are the droplet sizes from those emitted droplets that are going over there. Now I can use the calculation that I just developed, the framework that I just developed to figure out how many virus particles are going to be there in those specific droplets. And once we know that these are the, this many number of variants are going to be transmitted to the nasopharynx, I can then use some of the anecdotal reports on the exposure times during the super spreading incidents uh, that happened over the last few months to figure out, okay, this many people got sick over this range of exposure time. So how many virus particles are going to end up at the nasopharynx in that duration of time? So it's a very conceptual framework with a fair bit of very simple mathematics and some CFD. And using this, you can get an order of magnitude estimate on what the infectious dose might be or how many virus particles you want, you need to get infected. From my work, I saw that if the person who is already infected with the disease, if the person has an average viral load, which typically happens towards the middle and later part of the disease, uh, if you are exposed to that individual for one for five minutes, you are going to inhale 11 virus particles. On the other hand, if that other person is in the initial phase of the disease and is shedding more viral load because the infection is still in the upper airway and it's easier to shed, uh, then you might be inhaling in almost 4,000 variants per, per, per five minutes. I use these numbers, I use the anecdotal reports, and I see that the infectious dose is going to be on the order of a few hundreds. Now compare that to what we know for other infections. For example, as I said, for influenza A virus, the range is anywhere between 2,000 and 3,000, so which is almost 10 times higher. That, in other words, implies that SARS-CoV-2 is 10 times more infectious than any typical influenza virus. And that is what is driving this, this scenario over here. So this is a paper that is in review uh, right now. Uh, it has many of these this details. Another interesting thing that I briefly want to touch upon here is, okay, the infection has started in the upper airway. What happens next? The infection does go to the lower airway, to the lungs, right? For people who are really getting sick. What is the mechanism? I talked to the, the, the infectious disease experts, to the epidemiologists. 
they don't think that this is happening through cell to cell transfer because of how quick it is moving from the upper airway to the lower airway. They think that uh, it is driven by these boluses of nasopharyngeal liquids that carry these virions to the lungs. So that, that is a fluid mechanics question, right? Those, those big blobs of liquid going from the nasopharynx to the, to, the, to the lungs. And this is probably driven by the pressure gradient, the pressure at the wall, because it is driven by the shearing action at the walls and is moving towards the lungs. So this is an ongoing project right now. And from the preliminary findings, I see that this can also be connected to figure out why just some of us are getting really sick. We see that uh, the process is driven through something called aspiration. Aspiration is when we ingest liquids into our lungs. And these are the liquids, if they're coming from the nasopharynx, carry those virus particles. And this aspiration increases for people with swallowing disorders or people with dysphagia. Dysphagia is painful swallowing. Or people with sleep apnea, uh, those who snore a lot. So the chances that those people, if they get the SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, the chances are high that they will get really sick because they are going to ingest more virus particles into their lungs, thereby worsening the condition. And this can be a landmark study to figure out why some people are getting sick and why most people around us are not. I mean, I, I saw many COVID-19 people uh, around us over the last few months. None of them was hospitalized. So this is an open question. Why the 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 the, the progress of the disease is so different in, in different folks. Okay, so this is the paper uh, that is in uh, that is evolving right now. Uh, you can find this on my web page and it's on Med Archive. It's uh, a collaboration with, so Natasha over here is um, a clinician with infectious disease background. Brent is a rhinologist and uh, Dan and uh, Origit there uh, from dr drug discovery backgrounds. So as you can tell, you, we are, most of us here, I think on this call, we are all engineers, but uh, to make real progress in this era, we need to collaborate. We need to work with people from other disciplines. So this is end of track one, where I'm using the skills that I have uh, towards answering specific questions in uh, translational science. The next one uh, that I want to cover is how basic flow physics can be important in uh, clinical transport and can have uh, solid medical relevance. So for example, uh, this is the reconstruction of the entire mouth and throat. We see that in the narrower cross sections of the throat, there are some strong circulatory flows and that does have an effect on clinical transport. We are going to uh, uh, see one sub project on this, on this idea. But the sounding board uh, for this line of my work uh, actually goes back to the work I did during my PhD. And after that, uh, I did a lot of work on vortex dynamics, on drop impact. It had a fair deal of uh, high level mathematical modeling and dynamical systems. And all those are still helping me now as I work on the new projects where uh, they're more interdisciplinary than the topics that I was working on then. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly discuss three topics today. Uh, the first one is uh, related to thermal conditioning. Why I picked this, there is a reason for that. I want to show how the basic flow physics nuances like uh, vortex dynamics or, or heat flux, they can have uh, an important role in biomedical systems. So let's look at thermal conditioning first. So when we, when we inhale air in, uh, the air gets warmed up very quickly. For example, if you are, it's it's winter in Kolkata, right? Uh, it's not really winter. You have to ask me what is really winter because when I came out to work today, it was minus 15 degrees Celsius. So that is winter. In Kolkata, it is not winter, but still it's Kolkata winter. Maybe the temperature uh, in the afternoon is 20 degrees. Uh, so when you are inhaling that air in, uh, 20 degrees is still too cold for the air to reach the lungs because then it can harm the tissues inside your lungs. So the air can get very easily warmed to 40 degrees Celsius in a fraction of a second. And that happens uh, because of the transport process. Our nasal passage is very complex, very tortuous. There is a swirling flow and the vortices that are formed that helps in the heat transfer process to transfer heat from the surrounding tissues to the air. And in the process, 
uh, warming it up. And uh, this is not only true for us, this is true for animals and more so because animals, they have to survive in a wide range of climatic conditions. Speaking of which, uh, uh, the, the, where we live right now, it's, it, 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 as I said, it's snowed in everywhere, right? So, so my backyard patio is also snowed in and uh, I see that there's a cat which lives outside. So I leave some food for that cat outside. And uh, every day when I go back from work, I see that there are footprints of that cat. So that cat is actually surviving in the middle of the night. It's like minus 20, minus 25 sometimes. So that cat is surviving outside. So they do need to have some special skills that we don't have as human beings. So some animals, uh, in most animals, I would say, the nasal passage is more complicated than us. Uh, for example, uh, the visual on the top left, that's a pig's nose. Uh, and uh, I simulated the airflow through that nose and I see that so that visual on the, the, the third visual over there, it shows the heat flux trends. The heat flux drops as the air moves in because the air gets warmed up. Uh, the temperature gradient uh, is reduced and hence there is less, less transfer. So this is all basic flow physics and figuring out, okay, topological complexity does fit into that thermal transport process, but this can have strong clinical relevance as well. So, Patients who undergo very aggressive nasal surgeries, they develop a condition called empty nose syndrome. And empty nose syndrome is linked to a feeling of uh, difficulty in breathing. And actually heat flux can also be a measure for, for airway obstruction, for, for nasal obstruction or for mucosal cooling. So the mucosal cooling is cooling of the of the liquid uh, in your internal surfaces. And that actually gives you that sense of air inside our nose. So heat flux is a measure of that. And empty nose syndrome is when people develop this feeling of obstruction. So heat flux can be considered as a predictor of surgical success. If the heat flux is not really what it should be, then we know that the surgery has not really improved the quality of life of the person because that is what we are trying to do, right? Or not us, the doctors are trying to do. They're trying to improve the quality of life. So the heat flux can be a quantified measure that we engineers, we applied mathematicians, we physicists. I'm not a physicist, I'm not an applied mathematician, I'm just an engineer, but many of us, we can wrap our head around and figure out that this is the quantified measure that can help us to figure out if the surgery has worked or not. So uh, we looked at a particular clinical condition called Cranio, it's not a condition, a particular uh, surgery called craniofacial resection. It's a very aggressive nasal surgery. It removes the entire septum. Septum is the internal dividing wall between the two sides of the nose. So imagine that that wall is removed. It's a very aggressive surgery. But still, people don't really complain about any uh, lack in their quality of life after the surgery. So what is going on? So we gathered CT scans before and after the surgery, and we ran some heat flux simulations after the surgery. And we saw that the trends of how the heat flux is decaying is very similar to what happens in a CT normal subject. So the heat flux is not changing much. So that is actually helping the patient to feel as if he or she is healthy enough. So the heat flux can be used as a quantifier for surgical success, which is interesting. Okay. Another very small uh, discussion that I want to include today is on how vortices can affect clinical transport. And uh, engineers have been working on this kind of problems for a long time, how vortices help in particle trapping. Uh, however, most of the work uh, on those lines have been in very idealized in this particular case, T-section geometries. And uh, real world is not that simple. Uh, we have complex geometries. And uh, to figure out a better idea on how the transport process uh, happens or how, uh, or, or to better characterize how the particles will be trapped in the vortices that might be formed in these complex geometries, we need to know, we need to first have realistic anatomic topologies. Then we need to know the flow field. Then we need to know how the vortex trends are evolving. And then we have to try out a wide range of particle sizes or droplet sizes, which are of interest. And then we can get a better idea. And this line of work can actually help design better targeted drugs. As we are going to come to in this particular topic. So here we are trying to develop a new generation of medication for the throat. 
The condition is called vocal fold granuloma, where the small nodules are formed in the throat. And the drugs that are being used right now, uh, we see that they're doing some work, but it's I, at least I thought that things can be improved. Uh, so what I did was first develop this, this entire airway model, including the throat. I tried out different sizes of granulomas. And this part of the work was entirely in collaboration with the clinicians because I don't know how big the granulomas are going to be. I need their inputs. So I implanted those granulomas into that these this, this tumors are being formed. And I ran some simulations of particles going towards the throat. These are, by the way, turbulent simulations because the throat cross-section is really narrow and the flow gets really messy over there. And I see that the ideal particle size range for targeted delivery of drugs at that part, part of the throat, throat is eight to 10 microns. Now let's compare this size range, eight to 10 microns to the drugs that we are using now. The typical size range is one to four microns and many of them being too small they're actually following the streamlines and going straight to the lungs. They're not even depositing at the vocal fold granulomas. So there is a way where you can use computations. We can use experiments to come up with better designs for targeted drugs. And there is also the potential for personalized care because this study is still a preliminary study. I, I have just looked at a couple of subjects, but maybe the next subject would have a different size branch. So what if we transmit this information to the drug manufacturers? They can come up with four categories, say four categories of the same kind of pharmaceutical. And then the doctors by working with us can figure out which of those four subcategories would be suited for that one individual. And that would be great because then we would have a personalized drug for most of the population. Anyway, so I just wanted to give you a flavor of uh, the kind of basic flow physics uh, ideas that you can think of to help uh, the real world. Okay, the last one that I want to cover is, uh, the last one that we want to cover is, uh, that I want to cover is on bio-inspired uh, mask filters. And uh, this is one of the funded projects that we have on COVID-19. It's a collaboration with uh, two other universities, uh, Cornell and UIUC, and uh, I think Onik is on this call, but uh, he is a remote intern who is working with, with me on this project for the last six months. So most of the work that I'm going to show for the next few slides actually comes from his work. Uh, the idea is this, as I mentioned a while back that uh, animals have more complex nasal pathways and that helps animals with a high olfaction to screen particulates better from the inhaled air. And which in turn helps their sense of smell. So for example, dogs, pigs, rodents, they have a much more complex uh, nasal uh, passage than us. So the idea was this, can we use that idea to come up with very tortuous designs of the, of the filter in the, in the mask? And uh, by tortuous design, I mean each air transmission pathway that go into making that, that entire filter. So typically a filter would have around 200 to 300 such pathways. And we are going to check the tortuosity in each of those pathways. Okay, now we, it is difficult at the very beginning to simulate a real mask. So what we did is this, we designed the, 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 the filter and we had an upstream conduit and a downstream conduit. And we looked at the breathing action through that filter. We tried to simulate flow rates that are similar to breathing and uh, we measure the pressure drop because pressure drop is a quantifier of how difficult it might be to breathe through that mask. Uh, our hope was this, we are going to trap the particles that or the droplets that carry this virus and yet the filter would be more breathable than the currently available face coverings. So we have to keep track of the pressure drop as well that is driving that, that uh, breathing flow rate. And uh, as I have been saying, Computations is not the end of the world. You need to validate the data. So we worked with, we are working with another group uh, who are going to run similar experiments and who have already run some experiments. So we are basically having the, the setup in the computational world look very similar to the setup that they have uh, in the experiments. And then we simulated uh, uh, different uh, numbers for, for bidding through these uh, models. 
this graph actually shows you a comparison for uh, a type of pathway with the experimental data. On the y-axis, I have the pressure drop that is driving the flow. And on the x-axis, I have that flow rate. It is for tortuosity, which is close to 1.8 to 1.9. Uh, the blue one is the CFD uh, line. And we see that they, it is very close to the experiments, which is good. Uh, that means that the framework that we are building can be trusted. The next thing that we need to do is figure out, uh, is this mask even going to work? Is it going to trap the droplets that we are worried about? And for that, I or uh, we simulated uh, the, the flow and the particle trapping through this single pathway. Onik did a lot of the work and uh, we tried different breathing rates. We tried again the, the, the entire range from 15 to 85 liters per minute. And we saw that uh, the droplet tap trapping increases uh, over a certain size range. Uh, so this, 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 this is a heat map. So you can see that what are the droplets that are getting trapped, where the trapping efficiency increases. And here we see that there is a sort of like a bifurcating behavior. So if you just focus on the 30 liters, liters per minute, the droplet trapping was low when it was around two microns. It was high when it was around 3.5. And then onward, the droplets are all, all big and everything is getting trapped. So uh, we want to understand the flow physics of what is going on here, why there is this sudden shift. So let's look at that analysis that we have done. So here the top visual gives you the pressure plot data. And uh, on the bottom visual, you have the velocity uh, the streamlines for 120 representative cases. And uh, this one shows the, the trapping trends where the particles are getting trapped in that single pathway for 3.5 micron particles. Uh, the first thing that we try to understand is what is driving the trapping. I know that initially when the particles are coming into the pathway, inertia is there. So many particles would be trapped in the front walls just because of inertia. But the particles that are going farther down the, 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 the pathway, they are guided by the streamlines. And if the flow field has low pressure areas, which is because of the vortices that are being formed, then the particles will gravitate towards those low pressure zones. And that's what Onik and I saw here in this in the simulations. And uh, this is just a 3D view of the particle trapping trends or where the particles are getting trapped for 3.5 microns, but 3.5 micron is not the only droplet size we are inhaling, right? We're inhaling other sizes. So let's look at an overall holistic uh, picture. So if the droplets are very small, uh, let's try the 2.2 micron. We see that the trapping is more homogeneous throughout the pathway because many of these droplets, they're following the streamlines and actually many are escaping through the, through the outlet. So we, or this particular transmission pathway is probably not doing the best job of arresting two micron droplets. And that's what we saw from the heat map as well. 3.5 micron, yes, the trapping is increasing. Uh, and with the, uh, a uh, larger size, 10 micron, the bottom visual shows you that almost all the 10 micron particles are driven by the inertia and are getting trapped at the very anterior parts of the pathway. And uh, these are videos that actually tell you about the same physics. So on the left column, we are studying a 3.5 and a 10 micron particle from uh, the same starting location. And you see that the 3.5 micron particle actually managed to navigate the entire pathway and escaped through the outlet, while the 10 micron particle did get trapped. And similarly on the right, uh, the 3.5 micron particle here, it is not managing to escape the pathway, but it is getting trapped, but it is still making its way somewhere through the pathway. So this tells you the physics, this tells you how the particle sizes is driving the transport process, even in this kind of bio-inspired filters. Okay, so I think that wraps up the different projects that I wanted to discuss. And uh, what I'm going to discuss next is, what is the overlying story here? What are we trying to do? I think the two big challenges that are ahead of us for, for people in our generation and for people in your generation, I'm assuming most of you are undergraduates, so on an average, 
you guys are at least uh, 15 years younger than me. So I think the main challenge in our generation and in the next generation is the two main questions, healthcare and climate change. And these two qu questions are going to drive science. It's going to shape up science over the next 20, 30 years. So I hope this lecture helps you to get inspired and hopefully to think on the kind of really useful work that you would want to do. Uh, in my team, as I have been saying, I am developing the tools that can directly impact healthcare and uh, different biomedical innovations. But there are other ways to contribute as well. But you need to be really careful in thinking what you want to do. Now, this is a map of all the collaborations that I have right now, which are which are active. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, except uh, the founding uh, CEO at Fractal Therapeutics, uh, not a single one of them is a Bengali. And therein lies my motivation. We need to do something new. Uh, we need to do something like what this group of French mathematicians and engineers did in the 1930s. Uh, they developed this informal organization called Nicolas Bourbaki. Uh, the name was inspired from uh, the name of a French general from the 1800s. This group, they did a lot of research together. They wrote textbooks together. They published papers together. And in the process, they tried to revive French science. French science that had suffered the loss of one complete generation of young French scientists to World War I. They tried to correct that. Now, for us, let's think of the kind of scientific work that Bengalis were collectively known for. Let's try to revive that quality. Uh, we can write textbooks with the new wave of interdisciplinary content. I have one sample idea here. It's, it's based on a course that I'm teaching right now, engineering mechanics and biomedical sciences. Here I'm covering everything from statics, dynamics, uh, fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, and how that can be correlated to, to biomedical applications. So let's write textbooks together that can bring a change. Or we can collaborate on our overlapping areas of interest and write top quality research papers. And in some way, we can use these lectures to figure out those common interests that we have. And we can discover other ideas as well. And we can call ourselves Vanguard or maybe even Professor Shonku. So that concludes my talk. I hope you enjoyed it.